G'day, I'm Alex Bainbridge. Welcome to The Green F Show. Genocide, apartheid, South Africa and Israel. That's what we're talking about today with special guest Salem Valley. Most of this episode was recorded on Noongar Buja and I'm coming to you from Jagger and Turbul country. As always, we acknowledge this country was unceded, stolen land, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Also at the beginning, if you like the work that we do, please become a Green F supporter. Uh, it's the number one way to support our work as well as to um, receive the content that we produce. Today's guest is Salem Valley, who's a South African human rights activist. He's also South Africa's National Research Foundation's Chair in Community Worker and Adult Education based at the University of Johannesburg. He was in Australia last weekend for the Eco-Socialism 2024 conference uh, with a lot of fantastic uh, sessions were held. And you can see videos from many of those sessions up on the Green F YouTube channel and more are coming. This guest interview is conducted by Jonathan Remnack. Take it away, thanks. Hello, my name is Jonathan. I'm with Green Left, and I'm here with uh, Salem Valley. Uh, so, Salem, thank you for joining us here in Perth. Uh, the Palestinian Solidarity and Liberation Movement is sometimes presented as a point of unity between the countries of the Global South and a distinction between them and the countries of the Global North. Would you say this perspective is accurate or not? Well, firstly, thanks, Jonathan, for this time and um, Socialist Alliance for the invitation to me. Um, I think that today, for humanity in its entirety, there are two critical issues. Uh, one is uh, climate justice, uh, uh, dealing with climate catastrophe, and the other is Palestine. Uh, the Palestinian struggle brings together uh, many activists around the world. Um, you know, together with the genocide, uh, there's also an ecocide, there's scholasticide, there's domicide. And so it's also a struggle of an indigenous people. Uh, it's also about racism uh, um, and imperialism. So um, there is this intersectional issues that come together. Um, I think we need to distinguish between uh, the people of the world uh, in all countries, North and South, the majority world and the West, and uh, the ruling classes. Um, so uh, to give you uh, a quick local example. In Kenya, um, there have been protests against the World Bank imposed conditionalities today. Uh, and uh, there have been, according to some estimates, over 150 people who've been killed. People have been abducted. Now, the spyware that the uh, repressive forces in Kenya use is Israeli spyware. The tear gas they use is from Israel. And Israel has always played that role against the oppressed people, against working class people, and for um, initially oil companies, well, they continue to, and now weapons manufacturers. Uh, they have played this reactionary role since their establishment. Um, so, you know, I think there isn't an easy dichotomy. It is true that all colonized people in the majority world identify with the struggle of the um, uh, Palestinians. But there are also people in the north in inverted commas, and the West, uh, whether these are African Americans or people of color or indigenous people uh, or students, you know, who understand what is happening in terms of scholasticide. You know, every university has been bombed in uh, Gaza. Um, Professors have been killed, uh, close to a hundred, uh, four university presidents, thousands of students. So um, 
it isn't an easy north-south divide. It's a bit more complicated. Plus, we have the Modi regime, uh, we have the Saudi regime, you know, not necessarily in the north, many military dictatorships, Arab despotic uh, rulers. So, but I distinguish them from the masses on the ground. Um, but I think what we can safely say is in the same way the world was seized with the uh, fight of the Spanish people against fascism, uh, solidarity with Indo-Chinese people, with the Vietnamese people, with the struggle of people from Southern Africa against white minority settler colonial regimes. Today, um, uh, Palestine is one of those struggles that brings humanity together. On that theme, you've mentioned uh, the struggle against white minority rule in Southern Africa and the apartheid regime in South Africa. In a previous interview with Green Left, you mentioned that Israel today is worse than apartheid in South Africa. What do you see as the similarities and differences between those forms of oppression? Well, you know, the in the past few years, almost every reputable human rights organization, whether it's Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Israeli groups like Beth Salem, Al-Haq, Palestinian human rights organizations, and others, as well as many special rapporteurs at the UN on the occupied territories, the UN Human Rights Council, they have documented, sometimes in lots of detail, the kind of apartheid that exists. Now, we use the term apartheid, and it comes from South Africa, but the UN resolution on the suppression of the crime of apartheid is not limited to South Africa, uh, but it provides a legal framework. Um, and in terms of that framework, uh, the extent and the extremism of the Israeli apartheid state goes much further than South Africa. In broad outline, it has the elements of fragmenting the oppressed. Um, we had the Bantustans uh, in Israel or occupied Palestine. They have the West Bank, Gaza, Jerusalem, Golan Heights, you know, uh, the refugees in neighboring countries, in refugee camps, fragmentation of security matrix. In South Africa, we didn't have the South African military flying jets and bombing residential areas. They did in Mozambique and Angola, um, but not in South Africa, not in the townships, not in the informal settlements. In Israel, Israel has basically, with impunity, violated every international law. There are many South Africans who've been to uh, Occupy Palestine. I managed to go once, the second time I was deported. But people like uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, uh, church leaders, and they all say that what they've seen there in a limited time is much worse than South Africa. Um, having said that, I think that no two situations are the same, no two countries are the same, and there's a particular situation with the Palestinians that in South Africa, for a rapid accumulation of capital, the white minority regime, particularly the white capitalists, needed the super exploitation of black labor. They couldn't do without it. Mm -hmm. And they needed to export their products into other parts of Africa. You know, the kind of thing Cecil John Rhodes <laughs> tried to do from Cape to Cairo. Uh, and they couldn't do that uh, without some kind of settlement. Um, you know, Israel has, uh, over the decades, over close to eight decades, with the help of the West, 
with the help primarily of British colonialism initially, and then American imperialism, ensured that uh, more and more people settle in unoccupied territories, despite the fake peace treaties, the Oslo Accords, they've stolen more land, and um, they have, they, they, unlike South Africa, Palestinian labor, although still important in certain sectors of industry, like construction, by and large, it's not the same as South Africa. So uh, they can dispense with, uh, and I mean literally. And so what we see happening is a genocide, a fully-fledged genocide. Ilan Pape, a long time ago, talked about an incremental genocide. Today, it's not incremental. It's in our face. It's live. The whole world can see. The first Nakba in 1947, 1948 continues. And it's uh, now on steroids. It's the attempt is to get rid of Palestinians. So the urgency is even more. It's even greater. Um, so those are some. There are other uh, similarities and differences. I mean, one is the racist laws. Uh, there's 65 odd. Uh, racist laws in um, uh, occupied Palestine. There's military rule. I can go on, which are very f similar to South Africa. Uh, yeah. As someone who is involved in the struggle against apartheid in South Africa, what are some of the lessons you feel we can learn from that struggle in this current moment regarding the national liberation movement in Palestine? Well, you know, in, in South Africa, uh, we've had, like many countries, different liberation movements. I think one of the mistakes of the anti-apartheid movement, the dominant stream, was just supporting one organization, the ANC-SACP Alliance, um, and didn't acknowledge understand that there were other liberation movements. So the one lesson is that it has to be non-sectarian support. And uh, the second lesson is that, uh, you know, with all the criticisms one can make against the negotiated settlement, which wasn't a revolution, uh, it kept power and privilege mm -hmm. in place. It was certainly not a revolution that um, in fact uh, that's a lesson in the same way the Oslo Accords was a lesson. After the first Intifada they had the Oslo Accords which in a sense uh, made the situation worse. It allowed for um, the Palestinian Authority to, as some people say, um, you know, be co-managers of the occupation. It allowed for this collaboration. In South Africa, Nelson Mandela and the ANC leadership were promised freedom if they recognized the Bantu stands, and they refused to do that. Um, uh, so that's the other issue. The, the third issue is that uh, there were times in South Africa where it was very bleak, and gloomy and you know as late as uh, the 80s the mid 80s uh, and we never thought we would get even limited freedom or democracy in our lifetime but it happened and it happened because of a repertoire of struggles because of the boycott divestment campaign putting pressure particularly sanctions later on it happened because of the internal resistance of the people, which we felt was the most important pillar. And in South Africa, the workers' struggle, but community struggles as well, as we see in Palestine. So there were a number of factors. So I would say not to give up hope, and even in the bleakest times, to understand. Um, but I think that in the case of Israel, 
there's not going to be change, that the majority of the Israeli population are supportive of the occupation, but only when the privileges begin to be hit, there, and that can be done through uh, the boycott divestment sanctions campaign. So to look at that topic of understanding, looking at our current moment now with the current struggle in Palestine, what lessons do you think this reveals about broader struggles against capitalism, imperialism, colonialism and exploitation? What broader lessons can we derive from our current historical moment? Well, I think, you know, there's an Australian-Palestinian, Adam Hania who once expressed the importance of the Palestinian struggle is not just the depth of suffering and the length of their struggle. We're talking about a century, uh, you know, the colonialism before and eight, almost 80 years now of Zionism. But it's the central role of the Palestinian struggle for global capitalism. I spoke earlier about how Israel was almost an aircraft carrier uh, put by imperialism in the Middle East to keep this area region safe for uh, the oil companies. But, you know, they supported Central American and South American military dictatorships at one point, they supported the uh, military regime in Turkey against the workers' movement. And of course, uh, South Africans knew that uh, they were complicit in our oppression when all uh, relationships with the world, because of the strength of the BDS movement, all these relationships uh, 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 evaporated, you know, apart from Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, Israel continued uh, relations at the nuclear level, the military level, the trade level. So Israel has played that role today, and there are many writings like Jeff Holper, uh, who's written this book, War Against the People, and uh, Andrew Lewinstein, the Palestinian lab, basically how uh, high-tech security, how armaments are tested on Palestinians, literally on the bodies of Palestinian men, women, and children, and then sold abroad, field tested. And they play a particular role for empire, for imperialism. So it's understanding that, and it's also understanding that if you are on the left and you are involved in any progressive struggle, Palestine has to feature for all those reasons. Because what Israel has done is supply despots and authoritarian leaders with the means and the measures to suppress their own people, because they violated very early on the kind of, you know, liberals talk about the rule-based order after the Second World War, international law, international humanitarian law. Israel violated every one of them, and it's made it easier for other countries to do the same. So for all those reasons, um, it is vital that we put the Palestinian struggle front and center in all that we do and link the struggle with other struggles. Speaking of linking struggles with other struggles, here at um, Green Left we are eco-socialists and we believe that the ecological struggle, the struggle for the environment and the struggle for social justice are inextricably linked to each other. You can't have one without the other. Um, based on your experience in South Africa, what would you say is the nature and character of the movement for this struggle in South Africa? We have a very vibrant uh, environmental movement. Uh, people on the left understand the importance of uh, uh, 
uh, uh, climate justice um, and, and of system change, you know, that uh, also that fossil capitalism is linked to racial capitalism um, and that uh, in South Africa we have ASCOM which is coal-fired. It's one of the major contributors to greenhouse gases, uh, to carbon, um, and that our Minister of Mining and Minerals, Gwedi Mantash, who was the General Secretary of the ANC, the previous minister, of course, we don't know who the minister is going to be today, was very closely linked to mining interests. There have been a number of people in communities who have struggled against uh, mining companies, South African, but also Australian and Canadian. Uh, in South Africa, some of them have been killed. There's a celebrated case of Kolobani, where people have stopped um, mining interests from um, uh, extractivist industry. We have a number, because mining industry has been the bedrock of the South African economy for a long time. And there are many mining communities that have uh, resisted now. The South African ruling class still depends on uh, uh, mining and there are many corrupt deals as well. So there's a lot of work we have to do. Um, we, had, we have many organizations that are involved in international networks. Um, I need to also say that in Palestine, I mentioned there is an ecocide. I mean, Israel has uh, devastated amount, probably about 40% of orchids, they've uh, bombed 7,500 greenhouses, they have allowed sewage to sweep into, you know, the uh, radioactive ordinance is still there amongst the debris and amongst human uh, remains. Uh, the situation is absolutely awful the tons of explosions that have been used uh, is much more than uh, the Hiroshima bomb, twice as much, some people believe. Um, so the ecocide is there for us to see. I can go into many more details about the ecocide there, but I think that for us, our struggle is against racial capitalism in South Africa, has to include um, the struggle against um, uh, climate catastrophe. Um, there's also a racial dimension to that struggle. But finally, I want to say that in occupied Palestine, like elsewhere and in South Africa, there's a lot of greenwashing. Um, and Israel is uh, masters at propaganda, both whether it's greenwashing or pinkwashing, <laughs> uh, that's what they do. And there are environmental groups, liberal groups, who are seduced by that language. So I think it's up to the left to expose that fraud. In light of what we were speaking earlier about the universities in Palestine, what do you see about the importance of academic freedom re regarding this top, regarding the struggle in Palestine and some of the repression we're seeing in Western countries towards academics who are speaking up for Palestine? What do you see as the importance of academic freedom? Well, there are many uh, uh, related important reasons. Um, first of all, uh, Palestinians don't have academic freedom. Normally, when people talk about academic freedom, they talk about Israeli academics. Uh, the point is, Palestinians, you know, are regularly detained, tortured, 
killed students and academics, whether in Gaza or the West Bank. Uh, the situation is bad in the West Bank. Bir Zayt University has been closed on a number of occasions. The Students' Representative Council has entirely arrested. Students get killed all the time. People can't travel to conferences. Israeli academics are pampered. They get special concessions to go to Europe and North America and Australia. Um, they are singled out by the concessions they receive, not Palestinians. Uh, so whose academic freedom are we talking about? Secondly, academic freedom in a time of apartheid, occupation, genocide must feature. Uh, we, you know, they are, there's a couple uh, geneticists, uh, John uh, Hilary Rose um, uh, and her partner, Stephen Rose, who are part of the British uh, uh, academic boycott group. They both Jewish, and uh, Hilary has said that you know there was a time when um, Nazi uh, uh, scientists uh, held up eugenics, uh, a very ugly. Uh, form of eugenics who uh, spouted views on Russian hygiene. Uh, it's a very ugly concept on the pure race. And uh, British liberal and left academics refused not to work with them because they lauded the principle of academic freedom, <laughs> you know, so there are limits to academic freedom. Uh, I believe that people who support genocide uh, should not have the right to uh, continue as normal, you know, that uh, for me, uh, uh, a university, and to quote Stuart Hall, is a critical institution, or it's not a, an institution at all, that universities have to stand for social justice, that today academia, uh, because of neoliberalism, uh, lucre, money, comes before solidarity. Um, and I think that what we see today with the encampments in hundreds of universities, it has forced academics not to be neutral for some kind of abstract academic freedom. But it's as academics, as intellectuals, to take a stand against a genocide, against racism, uh, for the Palestinians' right for academic freedom. Uh, so that is our view, and I think that those who get shut down for uh, uh, expressing their view, and it's the Palestinian supporters in many countries, particularly in the US, in Germany, in France, in Australia, in Canada. Uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the right wing talk about uh, Cance, uh, uh, cancel culture, but actually it's used first and foremost against those academics who speak out against the genocide, and it's hypocritical, um, and it's uh, double standards. Well, that's come to the end of our interview. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you. You're welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today on the Green F Show. That was Salem Valley, guest interview by Jonathan Rumnuck. Um, and as, all, as I said at the beginning, if you like the work that we do, please do become a Green F supporter. It is the number one way to support our work as well as to receive the content that we produce. You can also support us on Patreon and also without spending a cent, you can uh, share this video or this podcast, give us a thumbs up or a five star review. Uh, tell your friends about the Green F Show, spread the word, help us build the audience for this um, for this material. And 
there's not no doubt many rallies and things we'll see you in the meantime but otherwise we'll see you next time on the green f show <laughs>